Hey folks, this is Pastor Mike, and you're listening to our Wednesday night Bible study online. We hope you enjoy this, and you can hear more of our sermons and teachings at www.visitbethelchurch.org. God bless you, and have a great day. Amen. Uh, I want you to think about a number tonight in the Bible. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. And uh, boy, God gave me a good lesson this afternoon. I probably won't tell it, but God gave me a good lesson today. And uh, so anyway, I had a good time studying the Word today, and I, and I thank God for what He showed me. And I want us to just talk about, we're going to be in Genesis, I want you to think of the number 33 tonight, all right? Think of the number 33. Numbers mean something in the Bible, amen? I mean, God has a pattern. He has just orders and patterns in the Bible, and some people don't believe that, and I can't help it, man. I just see it. It's there, you know? We look out in the stars, and we see order. There's patterns to this behavior of the stars, Amen. God set them in ordinances. He set them in order, in perfect order. And navigators and farmers and everybody use that. And they, they see the order of the universe. They see the order of, of, of different plants and animals. And every, everything, in the, everything in God's creation has an order. Then how come the Bible doesn't? You know, it, it never did make sense to me. The Bible has an order to it. And God speaks in order. He's not the author of what? Confusion. Okay? And uh, so our churches ought not be in confusion. Amen. They ought to just believe the Bible, and, and that way it's not confused. So anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and um, look forward to the day when we don't have to pray. Okay? Now, th- this life is full of vanity. It is full of vanity. We're just vexed everywhere we turn. And yet, um, God has given us something that rules over the vanity and that is prayer and we can use prayer and we can pray and i believe that you can ask god anything amen and god loves you and he'll hear your prayers so uh just pray for uh, just continue to pray for our church and um just the needs go pray for me tonight i'm awfully sore tonight i don't know if it's the weather or what so you pray for me tonight all right and uh just pray for one another and uh call upon the name of the lord tonight heavenly father i love you I thank you, God, Lord, for uh, always hearing our prayers. God, you're a very good God to us. And, Lord, there is, there is not a chance in the world, God, that we have ever earned your goodness. There's not one chance in the world that we have ever or, or will ever earn your goodness to us. But, Father, Lord, we are simply the recipients of your grace and your mercy, and we thank you for it. And I pray, dear God, that you'd be with Matthew today and give him a quick recovery. And I pray, God, Lord, that you'd help him and encourage him, Father, and, and just be with my family tonight. And, and, Lord, give us of your grace. And, Father, Lord, uh, we just pray for one another tonight. We thank you, Lord, for seeing Sister Bonnie here tonight. And uh, pray, God, Lord, that you'd just continue to give her healing. And, Lord, Father, we pray for Roy's brother. And, uh, Lord, God, that you'd give him healing. And, Lord, help him, Father. Lord, just bless other requests, Lord, that would be here tonight. And bless these, Lord, that have come uh, tonight, those who are watching or listening, Lord. I pray, God, Lord, that you'd encourage them. Lord, it's a, sometimes it's a lonely walk, God, that we have for you. And uh, sometimes, Lord, we get in situations in life where people don't want to walk that way anymore. And, Lord, we pray for them tonight. We pray for them. We ask you, God, Lord, that you'd show them the light that you've shown us. And uh, so, Lord, I ask, Father, Lord, there's somebody in my heart right now, Lord, that I promised I would pray for because... This person prayed for me a long time ago. And, Lord, it just made all the difference in my life. And, Lord, there's a situation right now, God, and you know what it is. And, Lord, Father, I just pray for this person and pray for the situation they're in. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, that you would just open up a very bountiful window of blessing, God. And, Lord, just help. Lord, we ask, Father, that you bless our enemies. That is contrary to our nature. We ask, God, Lord, that you'd bless our enemies tonight. Lord, by blessing them, Lord, we're asking, Father, for you to save them. And, Lord, that way they're not our enemies anymore. They're our friends and our brothers. And so, Father, Lord, just give us that spirit tonight, dear God, where we pray for people that we don't want to pray for. And, Lord, that we'll be a blessing to people that we don't want to be a blessing to. Just encourage us in the faith, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, any thoughts on the number 33 in the Bible? What does that mean in the Bible? 33, think about it. Think about how God uses that in the Bible. Christ was how old? 
He was 33. I mean, we just kind of picked that up. We know he started his ministry from, from the age of 30, and you kind of count forward the different feasts and past, you know, different things like that. And, uh, you know, so 33 or probably 33 and a half years old. And, and so I just, and I, that number is interesting to me because it's sort of a, I, I look at combination numbers. It's a combination of three. It's a compounding of three. And three, uh, you think, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, that's who Jesus was. Amen. He, in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But there's an opposite to that. There's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And that's what you find in Genesis chapter 3. There's a, the, when Eve was looking at that fruit, she saw three things in that deal. And that, that really wanted, that caused her to want to eat that. And so Christ died on the cross at 33. How many crosses was on Golgotha, by the way? Three. Why? Because the Bible says he was numbered with the transgressors. Isn't that something? God will just show you that stuff all through the Bible, and I think that's neat. So we're going to get into Genesis 20, 33. And I, I tell you, I've wrestled with this chapter because I, I just, you know, God showed me all over and over that number of meanings would, would, would follow the pattern laid out in the book of Genesis. And I don't have time to get into all that tonight. But that's kind of, you know, every now and then I'll throw something out to you where it just means that. The number 12, and that's God's promise, and you see that. And the number 33, and I kept reading Genesis 33 over and over and over again. And I really couldn't, I really couldn't dig this out very well. And I was just really struggling with it. And I thought, well, maybe I'm wrong about this numbers thing. No. Okay. Well, I'll say the Bible's not wrong. Amen? Okay. I'm not the Pope. I'm not the infallible guide. But God is, and God's going to sh- God just showed me something this afternoon. It really, really blessed me, really helped me. And so getting into that, I want us to look in, um, in, 30, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 30. <clears throat> because I was going to study chapter 33, and God said, back up a few verses. Let's look at something here. So in verse 30, the Bible says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Notice that E-L on the end of that word. Does anybody know what that means? That's El, Elohim. That's got God's name in it, okay? So Peniel, he said, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, there's a beautiful thing, and I really don't have time to get into it tonight, but you go into the book of Revelation, and the Bible promises you that one of these days you're going to be able to see God face to face. Amen? Right now, right now, we, it, we can't handle it. Moses wanted to see God's face, and God said, I'll kill you if I do that. Uh, I'm going to show you my back parts. Now, I want to just, uh, that's interesting to me, because that was Exodus 33. And there's something I know about that. When you, when you show somebody your back, you're showing them a number, 33. Because that's how many bones you have in your spinal column. He was showing him the only way that he could look upon God was through the one who was 33. And that's something. Okay? So that's the only way we can see God. And by the way, Jesus told us that. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? Okay? So anyway, but then one of these days, the, we won't need the mediator anymore because we won't be sinful man. So we will be able to see God face to face. And so anyway, so I was just kind of looking at that. And we're, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And so verse 31, and as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. Now uh, Genesis chapter 33, in verse 1, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. Now I want you to remember this, that Jacob is on his way to meet Esau and he has heard now that Esau is coming toward him with 400 men okay and so Jacob being a being the good shepherd that he is he's dividing up the flocks okay he's he's separating he's separating his wives and his children and he's sending them out she's okay she's all right sending out his wives and his children he kind of dividing them up and he says if I lose one you know maybe I'll still have the other Okay, so Jacob is a little bit afraid of what's coming down the road. And I'll tell you something, that might be just a good thing for us to remember every now and then. Because a lot of times, there's some, th- there's some scary things coming down the way, amen? 
There's some scary things coming down the way. And I, if you'll just pay attention to what's going on in this world, you'll understand that not everything in this world that's headed our way sounds all that, gra- sounds all that great. Amen? And we'd be like Jacob. We might be just a little bit concerned about what's coming down our way, and we might just kind of be prepared for that at all times. Anyway, Jacob uplifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them, bowed himself to the ground. Look at that, seven times. Okay? What's seven the number for? Completeness, perfection. Okay? Uh, until he came near to his brother. Uh, seven, the seven is attributed to the cross. Uh, the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I want you to think along those lines, okay? Because I want to show you where I'm going tonight. And verse 4, now look at this, verse 4. Now I want you to kind of get this picture in your mind. Here's Jacob, and he sees Esau and his 400 men, okay? And he's already divided up the women and the kids and everything like that. He's just kind of got his eye on Esau, and all of a sudden Esau breaks off in a run. Okay? Ugh. What's he running for? Okay, he's running to me. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, Uh, so anyway, Esau ran to him and to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Well, that's sweet, isn't it? Last time Esau saw, had anything to do with Jacob, he said, I'll kill him. I'm going to kill him. Jacob not only had tricked his brother in selling that bowl of pottage for his birthright, but then tricked him again by waiting till he was gone to go in to get the right-hand blessing from his father. And Esau was mad. He was angry. And uh, I want you to think for a minute about somebody that's done something to you that you're mad about, somebody, something, something they did that uh, you're upset about, okay? Um. Guilt is a burden that's too hard to carry, and so is anger. Amen? And so is bitterness. You can't carry it. You're not, you're not designed to carry it. It'll eat you away. It'll destroy you, who you are. And bitterness is a lousy, lousy, terrible, terrible thing. Bitterness is bondage. Okay, who you're bitter at, you're, you're a slave to. You're in bondage to. And uh, I, I don't like that. I really don't. I don't like that. I don't like being in bondage. But anyway, he lifted up his eyes and saw the women. This, so Esau ran on him, and he fell on him in his neck, and he kissed him, and they wept. Now, this is, this is how brothers ought to be, okay? And uh, so anyway, and he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given, who? Thy servant. And we talked about this before. There's nothing wrong with you having a humble attitude in every aspect of life. We are taught by our flesh and by our society and our culture, and we're taught by norms that are given to us on television and just about every other place to always try to establish our place everywhere we go. We're taught that. Some of you have it more in your nature than others. Some of you don't mind walking in a room, sitting down, and keeping yourself and minding your own business. But some people just, I mean, they can't handle it. But what they're the highlight of the party, they're the uh, center of all the conversations, center of attention. And they, they always go about establishing themselves no matter where they go. They, they want to be in leadership. They want to be in charge. Or they want to have a say in everything that goes on. These are people that speak their mind every time something pops in their mind, out flies it out their mouth. Okay? They are not a servant to anybody. And they have an attitude that they will not be a servant to anybody. And it could be a male or female. I'm not picking on women tonight. It, it's male and it is female as well, amen. It, it inflicts and hits upon just about every type of human being that there is, is that we want to, we want to establish ourselves in some form or some way of dominance. I even, I even see myself, uh, and I, I, let me just, maybe I just ask men this. When you go into a restaurant, how do you pick out where you're going to sit at? Has anybody ever been mindful of this? Huh? How do you do that, Wayne? I sit, sit with your back to the wall where you can, okay, that may just, may be a man thing, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's just a, 
you know, hey, you know, there could be danger, harm around here. But in some cases, we put ourselves in situations and immediately trying to start taking charge of, of just about everything, okay? Trying to, trying to have a dominant situation or a dominant deal in every aspect of life. And I'm telling you, if you're going to be a servant of the king, you might as well get used to being a servant of other people too. A husband should be a servant to the wife. Boyfriend to the girlfriend. Uh, I'm, I'm just telling you how it is. A pastor is not the one who says, you go do this, you go do this, you do this. I'll sit here. Okay? That's not what happens. A pastor is to be the servant to all the people in his congregation. He's to be their servant. He's to be their form. He's to do it. How many of you agree with that? Say amen. That's, that's, the, I mean, that's the whole thing. That was the thing about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. He said, I, I'm king of kings and lord of lords, but I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm going to show you how to be a servant. And Christ really is a servant to us in the sense that he serves us on behalf of his father's wishes toward us. Somebody say amen. Okay, so he's a servant to his father. But anyway, that's just what comes out of his mouth. He didn't say, uh, Esau, what's, what's going on here? Okay, he said, I, I am thy servant. Verse 6, then the handmaidens came near, and they and their children, and they bowed themselves. Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after, after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And I want you to look at this. Jacob here in this, in, right as of now, Jacob's the patriarch of this clan. And the wives and the children are watching the actions of the patriarch, the elder. They're watching the actions of the elder. Esau, and you all know how, how little boys follow daddy, okay? If daddy does something or if daddy says something that's okay, then it's okay as far as they, they kids will get their morals from their mom and daddy, especially their daddy. That's exactly how it works. And so Jacob goes and he bows himself to Esau and says, I am your servant. And then I want you to look at what happened here. Leah, Rachel, her children, all the children did exactly the way daddy did. And you just kind of ponder that for a while. Amen? You just think about that for a long time. Think about who's watching you. And let's say, let's maybe elders in this church, the elder men in this church. These, I, listen, I, I can tell you for a fact, as a little boy growing up in this church, I was watching those men. I was watching them. I was watching how they conducted their lives. I, I remember one time, there was a man, he did not go to this church, but at one time I went to the church that he went to. He was riding in the bus ministry. And he used to teach in the um, children's church there. Okay? And the first time I ever really, I don't know if I, you know, don't know if I really got saved or not, but I guess, you know, I've been saved forever. Amen, you know? So anyway, but he was one of the men that helped lead me. The first time I ever prayed a prayer, he was a, he was a man that led me. Well, I remember one time he worked for the electric company, and, and they was working on a pole outside our house, and he was up on that bucket truck up in there, and I heard stuff coming out of his mouth, and I went, that hurt me. That bothered me. It shook me. Okay? And I'm just saying... These young ones in this church, they're watching the elders. They're watching the elder ladies and they're watching the elder men. And that's biblical. It's the way it's supposed to be. Okay? And so you just kind of think about that. Let that temper and govern your actions, your character, your words, how you conduct yourself both in and outside of the church. Somebody's watching. Amen? That's not what I wanted to teach tonight. Amen? That's just a little sideline. Um, so anyway... Verse 8, he said, this is Esau, and he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? Which I met? And he said, uh, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Jacob is very, very humble. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that that thou hast unto thyself. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some. Uh, uh, well, but let, me, let me get into verse 10. Here's why God had me back up before chapter 33 a few verses verse 10 Jacob said nay I pray thee if now I have found grace in thy sight then then receive my present at my hand for therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of who he just saw the face of God back a few verses before this chapter okay now he's looking at Esau, and he says, 
Uh, therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou was pleased with me. Okay, now this may not be just, you may, bright lights may not be going off and you're going, oh wow! Okay, because it took a little while with me when I read that. I'm going, Lord, what does that... And by the way, ask God. Amen. If you don't get anything out of what I say tonight, go home and say, God, my Hoggart is such a mess. Would you, would you show me the truth? Amen. Okay, God will do that for you. Amen. So anyway, but now, now he's seeing the face of Esau. And I want you to think about this. When Jacob sinned, he sinned against God. He had also sinned against Esau. Now he has been forgiven by God by being allowed to see his face and live. And now he is forgiven by Esau as well. You see that? Okay? I'm going to get a little bit more in depth. I, God actually gave me a word, and I love getting words. Okay? I could act, I could act like a guy on TV. Oh, I'm getting a word. Oh, Shambhala Toyota, Toyota Celica. Okay? God gave me a Bible word, and it's a lot better than some stupid stuff. Amen? In fact, I want to, um, l let's read this, verse 11, then I'm going to kind of get into the words tonight. Um, verse 11, take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough, and he urged him, and he took it. And he said, let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, my Lord, know that this is Esau. Esau says, I think it's Esau in verse 12. He said, let us take our journey, let us go, and I will go before thee. And, he, and this is Jacob, I believe. And he said, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds are, are with, with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Esau says, Jacob, come on. Okay, let's just go be brothers again, and let's, you know, you just go with me, and we'll just have a good time together, kind of like the old days. Yeah. You know, I, I think of Brady and Bradley. I don't think of either one of them as one being hairy and one being kind of a girly man at home, you know. But, uh, but I, I see these two, and I, these boys have been at each other's throats for years. Amen. And they, they've had, you know, especially uh, now they've got the same Bible, it's a lot better. Amen. But when they're all messed up in different cults and stuff like that, they had literally at each other's throat and said, No, God's with me! <laughs> okay? And, and that's kind of how it was. Uh, but, you know, there's always a reconciling, and they just kind of want to get along. And, you know, I'm sure they have good memories of back, back in the years when they were kids and things like that, and they kind of want to relive that. And Jacob said, no, I can't, I can't go. You know, I, my kids are little. The, my goats are with, cat, or, you know, with babies. And I said, I'll overdrive them and kill them all. And he said, it's just not, it's just not wise. So you go on and just let me stay. Now, you listen to this. Um. Verse 14, let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure, until I come unto my Lord and to see her. And Esau said, let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth it? Let me find grace in, thy sight, in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way unto see her. Now, I, I, this, this part I like, um, because it reminds me of a feast. It's an unfulfilled feast in the Bible, okay? We have the three, three times a year, the Israelites are supposed to go to Jerusalem. Feast of Passover, 49 weeks later, or 49 days later, 49 weeks, so 49 days later, they were to tarry in Jerusalem until the Feast of, what, feast of Weeks or the Feast of Ingatherings. And then in the fall, they were to come back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? Passover is fulfilled, and it was fulfilled at Passover. I like that. Amen? God's just got a little clock that works. Amen? Uh, Pentecost was fulfilled at Pentecost. Okay? The end gathering. Isn't that something? Okay? Tabernacles is unfulfilled. Okay? Just kind of roll that around in your mind for a while and say, Lord, I'm ready whenever. Amen? Okay? But anyway... Um, but this has to do with tabernacles. And Jacob journeyed, verse 17, Jacob journeyed to Succoth. You see, a, a lot of times this feast is called the Feast of Succoth or the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him then house and made what? Booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the Feast of Tabernacles according to the Bible. I don't get much into Jewish tradition because I think it's wrong. Be careful of, of teachers that want to teach you these, well, the ancient Jews used to do this. I don't really care what they used to do unless I see it clearly in the Scriptures. Amen? I'm going to follow this Bible. And I don't care what the, the Jews got it wrong. 
When it came to understanding who the Messiah was, they got it wrong. And I really think you ought to be cautious about following everything that the Jews do. Amen? So, and and I'm not, I may not necessarily be saying that to you guys because you're just hillbillies from middle Missouri. Amen? Don't, I mean, and don't get it. But there's some people might be watching tonight that I'm sending a very strong warning to. Be careful of following after the Jews. Okay? Because not everything the Jews had was right. They, God used them to have the oracles of God, and that's all great. But be real careful, all right? So anyway, <clears throat> y'all don't mind I call you hillbillies, amen? All right. Even your Rochester hillbillies. Amen. All right. And, and you Canadian hillbillies, eh? Okay. And Jacob uh, journeyed to Succoth and built him a house. Well, here's, here's what happened. That at, at the Feast of Tabernacles... I like this. They would take palm branches and build these little booths, these taverns, tabernacle, tabernacle and tavern. Same, and the tavern is not a saloon. It's not a drinking hole. Tavern was like an inn, like a, if you were traveling, and that, back before Motel 6, amen? If you were traveling down the road on your horse or your donkey or mule, you pulled and you came to a town and there would be a tavern there where you could, get a, you could get a meal and you could get a place to sleep for the night and then carry on the next morning. Okay? But it all comes from the same word. It's like a temporary place. Okay? A temporary, the wilderness tabernacle was a temporary dwelling place of God. This right here is a temporary dwelling place of God. Okay? He's not staying. Amen. Okay. So anyway, um, they would build these tabernacles out of palm branches. Okay. Have you ever heard of Palm Sunday? Why? Where'd that come from? Huh? The the entry Jesus entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. What are they doing? They're going. This is prophecy right here. They're waving palm branches in Revelation chapter seven. Amen? You guys know it. Revelation chapter 7, John sees a great multitude from every kindred, nation, and tongue, and I mean everybody, and guess what they got in their hands? It's tabernacles. Okay? And so every day of the year, you, you don't say, well, bless God, when tabernacles gets here, I'm, I'm going to be raptured. I'd say, go home tonight and say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Because you don't know. All right? But anyway, that's just kind of, I like this. So verse 18, and Jacob came to Shalem. Shalem. Shalom. Yeru Shalem. City of peace. This is Yeru Shalem, Jerusalem. This is Salem. Shalem. The city of peace. Get where, get where the Bible's taking you here. In the last chapter, Jacob is wrestling with God. And he's wrestling with Esau. And now at the end of chapter 33, Jacob is resting in the city of peace. Okay? Jacob came to Shalem, the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram, and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent and at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for an hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. El Elohe Israel. I don't know who's calling, but anyway. Um, Gary, check the feedback here. Make sure we're still doing pretty good. All right. Somebody might be calling and say, hey, you cut off. Uh, anyway. He erected there an altar there and called it El. What did we say that meant? God. El Elohe Israel. The Lord God of Israel. Okay? It, it's, it repeats it. El Elohe Israel. In fact, it's in there three times. El El El. Isn't that neat? God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. Chapter 33. Okay. But let me, let me do this very quickly. We're still, we're still good? Okay. Um, maybe that was a Jewish rabbi calling saying, hey, knock that off. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 21. 
Now, I want you to, just while you're turning there, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to see something I saw in this, okay? Jacob and Esau, watch this now, this, uh, this is so not in our nature, but this is the evidence of the Spirit of God in people. Let's say that there's somebody, um, let's say there's somebody you hadn't seen in a long time, and the last time you had a, a deal with them, it was bad, okay? Big, big confrontation, big blowout, okay? And you come together again, what's in our nature is, is that we want to start up again, okay? We didn't finish this, okay? I want you to notice that when Jacob and Esau came together, there was not one mention of the past, not one, not one. Old things in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And God was in this deal of reconciling Jacob and Esau, and only God could have done this. Only God could have done it, because we do not have it in the power of our flesh to reconcile with people that we're mad at or are mad at us. We don't have it in our ability. And when God works together, it's just, a, I mean, it's, you know it's a miracle, amen? That way you don't go around patting yourself up, boy, I, blessed am I, because I'm a peacemaker. Wow, I just have this gift of just helping everybody all the time. Okay, you don't have it in your flesh. God has to put it in you to reconcile. And I want to tell you something. Pray that people that you're mad at or that's mad at you, that God would work out a reconciliation. Because I'm telling you, it's a lot better to have friends than enemies. It's a lot better to have friends than enemies. And I would. And I meant what I prayed a while ago. God bless my enemies. Because if he blesses them, I won't have them anymore. I'll have friends. And the older I get, the more friends I want. Amen? Okay? But anyway, God, the, the ministry of reconciliation is done by the power of the cross. Jesus had strong words about this saying in Matthew chapter, in Matthew chapter 5. This is where he preached the Beatitudes. And he moves on down. In verse 17, uh, Jesus said, no, let's see, uh, no, no, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Verse 21 Jesus said, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. My mom always taught me, don't, don't call people a fool, that's not right. Okay, you got to be careful about that. Verse 23, Therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar... And there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar. You know what God, Jesus is saying? I couldn't care less about your little pity little present that you brought to the house of God. I couldn't care less about it. What Jesus was interested in, he said, leave there at the altar and go thy way and first do what? Be reconciled unto thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. You know what our churches are full of? Our churches are full of people coming in here in their pious religiosity, acting all high and mighty, and having these big prayers everywhere. And, oh, bless God, all oh, the power of God came down in our church. And what it is, they, have, they, through their stupidity, have made enemies to just about everybody that they know, and everybody hates their guts. And Jesus said, I'm not honored by what you're showing me here inside this church. You go out here, and you start making friends of the people that you made enemies out of. And maybe it's not possible to reconcile with everybody. And I know some people's got a hard heart, and I know all that happens. Well, I want to tell you something. It, it won't hurt you to pray in that direction and say, God, please give me more friends than I have enemies, and make some of my enemies my friends. It won't hurt you a bit. Big thing, you'll have, you'll have to swallow a chunk of pride bigger than Matthew's tonsils. Amen? Matthew's asking stupid questions last night. Silly questions. I won't say stupid. Silly questions last night. He said, what happens if they drop the tonsil? It goes down my throat. <laughs> to be honest, I never thought of that one. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, you'll have to swallow a great big chunk of pride. But go back and try to make it right. Amen? Roy, what do they tell you at AA? One day at a time. Go back and make it right, if you can. Now, sometimes people are just people, they're, and they're not going to be as spiritual as you are. Amen? You, may, you might as well just deal with that. But it doesn't hurt to try. And then come back and make your offering. 
Somebody say amen. Romans chapter 5. And it's about, listen, and you cannot do this without Jesus being 33 years old, dying on the cross. Look at Romans chapter 5. The word was, rec- oh, I got a word from the Holy Ghost today. It was reconciliation. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Look at that. You were an enemy to God. Did you know that you made God, you you made him mad. You offended him. You violated his oath and his covenant. You broke his law. You made God angry at you and you were an enemy of God. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by how? The death of God. Of his son, 33 years old, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's all about reconciliation. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17. Therefore... In fact, read this out loud with me. Y'all all know this one. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Neither Esau nor Jacob was there. They were not even going to go revisit it. And a lot of times, that's not just to benefit the other person. A lot of times, that's to benefit you because nobody likes to reopen old wounds. And you get to a place in your life where you just say, you know what, I'd just soon move on and drop it and forget about it. Now, I don't know exactly what to make of this, but I'm reading Genesis 33, and I don't see either one of them saying, I'm sorry. But there already was forgiveness and sorrow and a humble spirit on Both of them. When Jacob offered him those presents, you never see Esau said, well, that's the least you could do. It's not what he said. Esau said, look, I don't don't want to take your presents. I don't need that. Jacob said, please, if I found grace in thy sight, please take it. And Esau graciously accepted it. You're looking at two men. I want to tell you what, this is one of the hardest things in the world. Uh, the book of Proverbs, I believe it says, a, a brother offended is harder to be won than, finish the, how does it go? Than, some, than a castle or something like that. A brother offended is harder to be, harder to be won than a castle with bars or something like that. I don't know, but that's, that you get the idea of it. Okay? And here are these two men coming together this way both being gracious to one another and servant to one another and accepting and loving of one another and in consideration of one another. If you ever just need a good lesson on how to be a good Christian in a good Bible-believing church, read, read Genesis 33. Amen? Read Genesis 33. Some things just need to get over and forget about it. Can I hear you say Amen. Just get over and forget about it. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now verse 18. Look at what it says. And all things are of God who hath what? Reconciled us to himself by, 33, by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. God forgave us. That's why it's built into the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God gives us a ministry of reconciliation, being able to forgive people. And, and I will say, it takes, it takes a great man to humble himself and apologize when he's wrong. It takes a greater man to forgive when no apology has been given. So I'm going to encourage you. Spend some time with the Lord, deep in prayer, get in your Bible. And if it might help you to start making a list of everybody that you're mad at. And forgiving them. Right then and right there, forgiving them. A ministry of reconciliation. 
to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them do you see that God wasn't holding it against them neither should you neither should we and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation the whole Bible is about trying to make things right amen Ephesians chapter 2 verse 16 I don't have too many more of these we might get out okay Ephesians chapter 2 verse 16 the Bible says in that he might reconcile both unto God in one body how 33 you stop and stop and think about now all the things that Jesus nailed to the cross and your transgressions and your next door neighbors and if God can forgive them you can too the greater sin is against God not us sinning against God is eternal sinning against you only lasts a lifetime if that and then it's over with sinning against God is, and if God can forgive them he has given us a ministry of reconciliation God Jesus has already nailed their sins to the cross it's already there waiting for their acceptance okay uh, anyway, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. When Christ died, he killed the battle that was between you and God. But also, that ministry of reconciliation being in us, he kills the battle between us and other people. I mean, if you believe that, say amen. And you guys know me. Everything to me is about the Bible and the cross. Everything. It's not about seven, let me give you seven, let me give you seven tips on how to really reconcile with somebody. I don't have the first clue. I'm not a psychologist, amen? amen. I was, uh, we was in the waiting room this morning, they had Disney or something like that on there. And I was just watching commercials and everything on these things, it has to do, all the toys that they're selling now to kids has, has, have some kind of psychological lesson to it. Everything's about psychology and making your kids better, understand things better, and understand their emotions better. And if it, you know, come on, kid, let kids be kids, amen? They don't need to be psychologists sitting on a couch somewhere, amen? And so I'm not a psychologist, but what I am is I'm a believer in the power of the book and the power of the cross. Colossians chapter 1, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Colossians chapter 1, this is the last one I have, verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of the, his cross, that's 33, okay, and by him to reconcile all things in himself, and by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Listen, God's got a greater battle in heaven than we've ever fought down here. Go read Revelation 12. The, whole, the devil and one-third of the angels is at war. Verse 21, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is, which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. It's all about reconciliation. Now, like I said, some people, you may never be able to get a chance to go to them and say, I'd like to, I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to, you know, I love you, and I want everything to be over. You may not ever get that out. Some people, some people are dead. Some people never want to see your ugly face anywhere in this world. You may never get that opportunity, but I can tell you, if they want to be in bondage, let them be in bondage. But you can be free by forgiving them and forgetting it. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Forgiving and forgetting. And it's all the power of the cross. And by the way, at the end of you making peace with God, and making peace with your brother, then you rest then in Shalem. 
city of peace. And you'll rest there. And God will bless you. Can I hear you say amen? Stand to our feet. Hello, folks. Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believed in eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life. And you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in his word, and God has never broken his word. God promised in his word that he would forgive you and that he would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.